Okay, a brief synopsis of a fairly long video from some fairly fundamental ideas. Uh, this synopsis is intended mainly as a review, not a substitute for the original where everything was constructed before your very eyes. It's going to point to the boards, point to the main ideas. We have the interval from zero to one. We cut it in half, and then one half is the coordinate of the point here. If the coordinate of this point is zero, the coordinate of this point is one. This is one half. If we cut that in half, we get half of a half, which is a fourth. Why is it a fourth? Because one, two, three, four of these would make up one. Okay. If we cut that in half, we get an eighth. And then one eighth maybe needs a little arrow to indicate it. Okay. And the, why is it one eighth? Well, because it takes two of these to make a fourth. It takes one, two, three, four fourths to make one. So it takes eight of these to make one. Uh, so in particular, well, I'm going to go there. Okay. Now we could continue to subdivide. We could subdivide this interval into equal pieces. And we get one sixteenth. Divide that into equal pieces, we get one thirty second. Divide that into equal pieces, we get 1 64th, meaning it takes 64 of these little tiny intervals here, if you can see them with the resolution of your screen, to make one. If I did this accurately, that's going to be the case. Um, okay. We could subdivide other intervals. I could write the interval from zero to two. Now, you might say, well, that interval is no longer than this interval, two is bigger than one. Yeah, this is a different picture. We scaled it differently, okay? So the scaling changes from here to here. We're not assuming we have the same scale here as here. And we're certainly not gonna assume it down here where this interval represents one eighth. Okay, so anyhow, there from zero to two, well, we divide that, we get one, divide that one half, one fourth, and then we go down to an eighth, we go down to a sixteenth, and we could probably get a 32nd. We try to do a 64th. The chalk line here is, you know, we, we, we can't locate a chalk line close enough. And pretty soon the chalk lines just start running together. Okay, if we do the you know, from zero to an eighth, well, we divide that in two, we get a sixteenth. Okay, and then a 32nd, 64th. And we're just basically magnifying what happened here or here. Okay, this is the interval from zero to one eighth. That's taking this interval. And just kind of blowing it up so we can, like with a microscope or something, so we can see what's going on. Um, so we get these numbers. Ask the question where is one tenth? Well, one tenth is a little less than one eighth because it takes 10 one tenths to make one. It only takes eight one eighths to make one, so one eighth is bigger than one tenth. But one sixteenth is clearly smaller than one tenth. So one tenth is between one eighth and one sixteenth. And you might expect in it so that it's quite a bit closer to one eighth than it is to one sixteenth because 10 is closer to eight than it is to 16. Uh, and then we get into questions of linearity and stuff that we don't want to talk about. But just not hard to understand that this is one eighth and this is one sixteenth and this is reasonably one tenth. And then where's one one hundredth? Well, we got down to one sixty fourth when we labeled this. The next subdivision would be one over one twenty eight. And one one hundredth is a little more than one over one hundred twenty eight. Where's a thousandth? Well, it's ten times closer to zero than one one hundredth is, just like one one hundredth is ten times closer to zero. Then one tenth. Let's see if that works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, something like that. Okay. Um, anyhow, you divide this little interval into ten pieces and you get one one thousandth. Okay, that's a, these are important pictures. Uh, of course, we can do the same thing with vertical intervals. The interval from zero to four, for example, could be subdivided at two, and then uh, cut that in half, we get one, cut that in half, we get a half, cut that in half, we get a fourth, and where's a tenth? Well, 
an eighth, we cut the fourth and a half, and a tenth is a little less than that, so it's maybe about there. Uh, to do one one hundredth on this picture would be hopeless, and to do one one thousandth would be really hopeless. Okay. Chalk lines are too wide. You'd actually be able to see one one hundredth here. You know, you'd have to have fine, uh, you know, fine point marker or a fine point pencil. Uh, but we're not going to be able to do it with chalk, and even with a good pencil, you're not going to get a thousand from it. Okay. Now, uh, we want to talk about some basic uh, arithmetic ideas. What's two squared? Well, everybody knows two squared is two times two. Okay. To make a little more sense out of the term, we can take a square, two units by two units. And what we did, first we divided it here, and that's going to be half of the square. Then we divide it here, and that's half of each of the halves. So we cut the square in half, and we cut those halves in half, and we get four one by one squares. Each one by one square has an area of one. So we have an area of one here, an area of one here, one here, one here. Total area is four. So two squared is four. Here's a picture of two squared equals four. Here's a picture of three squared. We take the square and we divide it into three parts this way. And then we divide each of those parts into three parts by cutting it here and here. We get three squared equals nine because there are now nine of these regions. Another way of looking at two squared, two twos is four, okay? Two times two, there's a two and a two. So here's a two, that little bracket there, there's two, and there's two more, there's four. Compare three squared, which is three times three. Well, again, we have a different scale down here, uh, but, Here's three. We need three of those. Three times three, three threes. So we need another one and another one. That makes up nine. There's a picture of three squared. You want to be able to think in terms of these pictures. You want to have these pictures there when you find that it's useful to have them. And it's very useful because what we're heading toward is definitions of some basic functions you add a little bit of algebra and you have the whole course, okay? Most of the whole course. Okay, well, what about two cubed? Okay, well, I draw a cube. And then I can cut it in half. Cut it in half this way. So we've got a top and a bottom half, okay? Now I've got, well, this is a two unit by two unit cube. Okay, two units in each direction. I cut that thing in half and I've got a couple of essentially two by two squares. Okay, I cut it in half again. Chopped and cooperate very, very well. Slice it this way. Now I've got four kind of, it's a rectangular prism, kind of like a cylinder, uh, kind of like a bar. Uh, and if I cut it again, now I've got eight little cubes. So two cubed, we take a two by two by two cube. And we slice it this way, this way, and this way. Three slices, cut it in half, cut each of the halves in half, cut each of those in half, and we get a total of eight one by one cubes, total of eight units. So two cubed is eight. Okay, another way to see it on the number line, we've got the interval from zero to two. So we've got that interval and another one. Now we've got two squared, which is four. And then we got two of those, which is eight. And if we went out to another one, we get 16 beyond about here, and so forth. 
Um, and again, another important picture, two important pictures, physical cube and the cubing on a number line. Um, what about one half squared? Well, we start with a one by one square and we cut it in half, that's one of your halves. And then we cut each of those in half. We take half and we take half of each of those. So we have it once, we have it again, then we get four pieces. So one half square is one fourth. Each piece is one fourth of the original because they're four equal pieces. Do the same thing with a cube. We cut it in half. I'm sorry, well, we take half of it, which is the same as cutting in half. Half of that, half of that. If it's a one by one cube, then each of these pieces is one eighth of that one unit cube. Okay, so one half cube is one eighth. Of course, we know how to do that with arithmetic if we understand how to multiply fractions. But, you know, unfortunately, I can't assume people know how to multiply fractions at the beginning of a pre-calculus course. We deal with that early. Uh, so if you're resting on multiplying and adding fractions, uh, We'll fix that soon. Okay. Another way you take your interval from zero to one, take half of it and take half of that. And there it is. There's one half squared, which is now one fourth because it takes four of these to make one. One half cubed. Well, it means you take a half and a half and a half. Means you cut it in half, cut that in half, cut that in half. And right there is one half cubed, which is of course, one eighth. It takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these to make one. Okay, that's the basic meaning of arithmetic. Arithmetic is not something that's done on a calculator. Arithmetic is something that has meaning. And too much use of the calculator, uh, something that our entire curriculum is terribly uh, guilty of. Uh, leads people not to understand these things making it harder to understand the deeper mathematics. Okay. Now we start into a little bit of algebra, a little algebraic representation. Get <clears throat> our values of x squared for x equals zero, one, two, three, and so forth. Okay. Well, if x is zero, we get zero, well, okay, we're gonna get, for these values, we're gonna get zero squared, one squared, two squared, three squared. Zero squared is zero because if you got zero and take zero times that, you still have zero. You, no matter how many times you multiply by zero, you get zero. Okay. One squared is just one times one, which is just one. Two squared is two twos. Here's two, here's two. Two times two which is four. Three squared is three times three times. Three, okay. Um, it's three times three, which means three threes. Okay, so that badly married. So we got to start with a three. You know, we got to have three of them, one, two, three, which makes nine. You can actually draw a little curve through these graphs to kind of show how these numbers progress. Everyone out here in conjecture where 16 would be, which they all did, should be a little bit more out there. Okay, you get a curve that looks like this. And we're gonna end up shortly getting a graph of X squared. We're gonna build it up uh, by simple examples. And simple examples that go to the heart of what arithmetic means. Uh, so we're not out here in calculator land doing our arithmetic and not understanding what any of it tells us. Okay, uh, values of two to the X for X equals zero, one, two, three. We want to contrast the values of two to the X with the values of X squared, okay? Now, start with two to the zero, okay? Let's kind of erase what I drew here. 
where I said the two to the zero is one. It is, but let's pretend we don't know that yet. I'll just get rid of that two to the zero equals one. Okay. Of course, now that you, you know, once you've seen it, it's hard not to see it, but let's go on. Two to the one. Well, that's just two. Two squared. Well, that's two times two. Here's two, and here's two. It takes two twos. Okay. And that gives you four. Two cubed. Okay. Well, that's you take two and you multiply it by two, so you get two of them. And then you multiply that by two again, so you get two of these. So you get this and this, which gives you eight. And two to the fourth. Well, without going into all the detail, uh, if two cubed is eight, that's a result of multiplying two by two by two. You get two to the fourth, you multiply by two again. So you take that eight and you do it again and you get 16. Now, if you connect these points with a smooth curve, you see that smooth curve. If you run from here to here, it's getting less and less steep and it continues doing so. Next one would be two to the fifth, and that'd be 32, be twice as far as this. Every time the point gets twice as far from zero, it's not what happened up here. I mean, here it got four times as far, here it got two and a quarter times as far, you got to 16, it's not even two times as far. That's worth actually thinking about, but for right now, let's just move on, okay? Now, if we trace the curve from here to here, it's getting steeper and steeper. If it keeps getting steeper and steeper, it ain't gonna go through zero because a lot of people wanna say two to the zero is zero. Okay, matter of fact, a majority of people coming into pre-calculus will tell you the two to the zero is zero. And I can't tell you how bad that is. Uh, not that you are bad as pre-calculus students you think that, but our curriculum, and again, overuse, over-reliance on the calculator, uh, no matter how many times people see the two to the zero is one, they never believe it because they haven't actually had to think about it. Um, okay, anyhow, I'm gonna make you think about things. You gotta think about things. This is getting steeper and steeper. It makes a lot more sense for this to continue getting steeper and going through one than it does going through zero. Now that's no proof of the fact that two to the zero equals one. It's actually something we simply declare because it's consistent with all the other rules of arithmetic. Okay, and we'll see that, uh, but we're not gonna talk about it today. Okay, well, there we have that. Now we move on to the definitions of what I call the basic functions. Now, where's my first one? And that would be the basic squaring function, which I contrast with the basic cubing function. So I want to put that one up here too, make sure that we can see what we need to say. The basic squared function is just y equals x squared, the thing we just saw. And the basic exponential function is y equals two to the x, the thing we just saw, the other thing we just saw. Okay, now there's a lot of stuff on the board here, but just ignore everything but the table. You got a table for y versus x. For the x squared function, here are the values of y corresponding to these values of x. Now, what are the values of x? Negative two, negative one, negative one half, zero, one half, one, and two. Notice that these are the numbers you get. If you take the interval from zero to two, cut it in half, you get one. Cut that in half, you get one half. So let's see, here's two, half of two is one, half of that's one half. And then we got zero here. And then we go to negative two. Well, we cut the interval from negative two to zero in half, we get one. Cut the interval from negative one to zero in half, we get negative one half. I think I said one, negative two, negative one, negative one half. And the arithmetic of calculating these is extremely straightforward. Uh, but we've already seen the meaning of these calculations, okay? Uh, if x is two, 
Then of course, x squared is two times two, which we can visualize in any number of ways. Here's two and here's another two. So there's two times two, that's four, okay? One half squared is one fourth. Why is that? Because we start with an interval from zero to one, take half of it, here it is, and take half of that, here it is, that's one fourth of one. So one half squared is one fourth, two squared is four. One squared, one times one is one, zero times zero is zero, and so forth. Then uh, when you get to the negative numbers, um, negative two squared is negative two times negative two. Well, you multiply two times two with two negatives. Two negatives give you a positive, you get plus four. Negative one squared is one. And negative one half squared is negative one half times negative one half. Again, two negatives gives you a positive, and half times a half is a fourth. If you know how to multiply fractions or not, you can see that half of a half is a fourth. Okay? Um, so right there are the values that we get for y equals x squared. Now, we're not doing this with a calculator. Keep your hands off that calculator. Don't let you use a calculator for any of this. We use a calculator later when we need it. Calculator later. Hmm, don't know if I've ever said that. We'll use, a, we'll use a calculator at a later time, but we're not going to do that right now. Um, we're going to go to the basics. Keep your fingers off of those keys and don't make these decimals. Okay, I mean, I want you to know what the decimal equivalents are, uh, but um, yeah, there are a lot of ways you can mislead yourself, especially when something isn't representable as a terminating decimal. Okay. In any case, we can now graph. Now, since the graph is already up here in all its glory, uh, got to emphasize the fact that your basic squaring function consists just of the seven points you get from this table. At this point, this point, this point, If you know, this one isn't going to get posted until the actual videos have been assigned and uh, so forth. This is for review. Okay, so anyhow, if you saw the basic videos, you saw that we have only the seven points. That gives you a domain, domain being the set of all your x values of just these numbers, just the numbers in this column. You see them right here. The range is the set of all the y numbers. They don't have to list them twice. Four is in the set. There it is. You don't have to list it again just because it's here. Okay? The thing takes a value of four. It takes the value twice. That's all right. But there's four. Okay? It takes the value of one and one fourth and the value zero as well. <clears throat> so listing these from least to greatest, zero, one fourth, one and four. There's your range. Okay. okay, well, let's look at the basic exponential function before we come back and look at more. Basic exponential function is y equals 2 to the x. Evaluating numbers, first of all, we start with zero. Now, I said 2 to the zero is 1. You can say that so because I said it is. Well, because everybody said it is. And because of reasons, uh, you know, the continuity of that one curve that we saw earlier. And uh, there's an algebraic reason that I will show you, but I'm not doing any algebra right now because I can't assume uh, that people uh, remember their algebra very well at this point. We've got to develop those algebra skills gradually. Okay. Well, Two to the zero is one. So uh, we have zero, we get one. Okay, two to the one half. Now there's a problem with that. You don't know how to calculate two to the one half except to use your calculator. I know how to calculate two to the one half using 
Taylor series, and I can write down the Taylor series and show you how that's done. You have to understand, you know, at least a semester and a half of calculus before you get to the Taylor series. Uh, so you won't understand where it came from, but I can write down the rule for calculating two to the one half. The problem is the rule never ends, it goes on forever. You can't ever get the exact value of two to the one half. And we're going to stick to arithmetic that we can do. Okay? So you can't do the arithmetic to evaluate two to the one half. You could do the arithmetic to evaluate it to three significant figures or whatever. Uh, uh, but nobody in their right mind actually does that arithmetic more than once in their life. Okay. So y equals two to the x. If x is zero, y is one. If x is one, y is two. But two to the one half can't be calculated, so we don't use it. So we just kind of cross it out. We don't include it in the table. It doesn't mean the two to the one half doesn't have a value. We just can't write it out exactly. We can't locate it exactly on a graph. Not that our graphs are all that exact to start with. Okay, so two to the one half can't be calculated exactly. We don't use it for the basic function. It's an important value, but we don't use it. Two to the one equals two. Two to the second equals four, as we've seen here and here plenty of times. So these values are obvious. Now, the one thing that's not obvious and that people, almost nobody comes into pre-calculus knowing the rules of exponents. Um, so that's just the way it is. Um, one of the basic rules is that a to the negative b is one divided by a to the b. Okay, now that should ring a bell, but I'm not sure it will for everybody. If it doesn't ring for you, don't feel too badly. Just make sure you know it. Make sure you know that rule. And I'll show you again algebraically why the rule applies probably within the first couple of classes. But right now, we're, we're just going to take that as a rule. Okay, so what's two raised to the negative two power? X is negative two, of course. We substitute negative two for X, we get two to the negative two. Well, by this rule, it's one over two squared. And that's easy, that's one over four. So it's easy enough if you remember the rule, and if you understand the rule, two to the negative one is one over two to the one, that's one half. So now we have values here and here. Again, using this rule, that's really easy. You just gotta remember the rule. And you gotta quote it when you're telling me trying to convince me that you understand what you're doing, okay? Okay, well, the basic exponential function that has a domain that doesn't include negative one half or one half, okay? Not for the basic exponential function. It just includes the x values negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. There they are. At your domain. Your range is a set of y values that you get, which consists of the numbers one fourth, one half, one, two, and four. There they are. There's your domain, there's your range, there's your basic exponential function. The graph consists just of the five points in orange, doesn't consist of a curve. Okay. But you see curves. So why are the curves there? Well, because I grew because then we say we extend the graphs of a basic function. We extend this seven point graph by drawing a smooth curve through these points, okay? And that gives us a picture of the extended basic squaring function. Well, there it is, there's the picture, okay? Um, I did a little more with it, and we'll do that in a minute. Uh, and we talk about the domain and the range. Um, and the, the board's got a little confused. So I'm not going to talk about the domain and the range of this thing yet, except to say that the domain consists of all the x values between negative two and two. Because now you have all these points on this curve, and 
for every x value from negative two to two, there is a point on this curve. Okay, so that the domain is all possible x values that go from negative two to two. The range is all possible y values, which go from zero up to four, because there are points on this graph for every y value between zero and four, and no points outside that interval. Okay. You know what I do with this picture? Okay, so basic exponential function. It also has a domain and a range. The domain is again, okay, there are points on this curve. It's not the same as this curve, but there are points on this curve, uh, on this curve for every x value between negative two and two. So your domain would be all the x values from negative two to two. Well, let's pull this over a little bit so we can see everything. So here's your extended basic exponential function. Its domain is the interval from negative two to two, the closed interval from negative two to two. If you don't know what a closed interval is, go back and see the original, um, original video. It's much longer than this one, okay? But there's your domain, all the values from negative two to two in your range. Well, it consists of all x values from one fourth in this case, because at negative two, this thing's equal to one fourth, this function's equal to one fourth. And you have to go to the left of negative two to get values less than one fourth. And the extended basic function starts here and ends here. It doesn't include. X values past negative two to the left of negative two or to the right of two. Okay, well, the range then goes from one fourth, which is the value the function takes at negative two, up to four. So there's your range. Okay. Now we'll talk about the domain and range of the extended basic squared function, which are pretty obvious. Uh, but it's on a different board that I can't put up here just yet. Let me do something here to make an important point. We excluded one half here because we can't calculate it, not because it doesn't exist. Not because the value doesn't exist. There's a value of this function. If x is negative one half, there's a value for it is one half. From this graph, which I've made fairly carefully, turns out we can make a pretty good estimate, or at least a half decent estimate, of what that, those values are. Okay, we want to estimate y equals two to the one half. Well, that means we want to estimate the value of y when x is one half. So if x is one half, what's the value of y for this extended basic function? Well, we just come up to the graph, come straight up from one half, and we find the graph point where x is equal to one half. And then we come over here so we can estimate the y value. Just have a projection line up here, projection line over here. And we estimate the y value here. And I drew this little white mark here because that subdivides the interval from one to two into two equal parts. And this comes out a little below that. So we make the estimate that that looks like about y equals 1.4. Okay, it turns out that the actual value to three significant, four significant figures is 1.414. Okay. So the graph actually, against all odds, gave us a pretty good estimate, okay? Also, if y equals two to the negative one half, that is, if x is negative one half, what's two to the x, two to the negative one half? Well, you go to x equals negative one half up to the graph over, and you see that that looks like about 0.7. So that's about what it looks like, I think about 0 0.707, pretty sure that's right. Um, a couple important numbers right around 0 0.7, like the natural log of one half and so on. Um, sorry, natural log of two. Um, but if you do the reciprocal of 1.414, 1707 seems like it's going to be right. Okay, well, anyhow, enough of my musings. 
So all this we can get from this extended basic exponential function graph. Again, you have the basic function consisting of five, whose graph consists of the five points, the table consists of just this. You draw the smooth curve starting here and ending here, you get the extended basic function. Now the whole doggone exponential function just keeps going from here and it keeps going from here. Okay. And by understanding the basic function, at least on this limited interval, we can extend our understanding to get a much better understanding of the exponential function than we would get if we just relied on punching buttons. And that's important. It's important in its own right. And it's important for understanding calculus when we get there. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more about the basic squaring function before we get on to our last of the three basic functions I want to talk about today. Uh, what are the domain range and so forth? Well, the domain is the set of all x values from negative two to two. You've already seen that. What's the range? Y values go from zero to four, as we've seen. Okay, so there's a domain and range of the extended basic squaring function. We can do some estimates. Now, if you have an x value, it's easy to square it. You just multiply it by itself. Now, if it's a big long number, you know, it, it might be uh, pretty tedious to calculate it. <coughs> if it's an irrational number, good luck. But, um, you know, it's approximated, which is about all you can do. Uh, but the significant question here is, if I know what the value of y is, can I find the value of x? Well, sure. If we want to find the x value that corresponds to y equals 2, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go up to y equals 2 here. We're going to find the graph point for y equals 2, and we're going to see what its x corner is. We do that with projection lines. And again, we come out somewhat closer to 1 than 2. We get x in about 1.4. Actually, it turns out to be 1.414 and so forth. Same as what we got for the exponential function, but on a different question. OK. There's also another value. If x, if y equals two, you get an x value over here, which would be negative 1.4 approximately. If we want to get y equals three, what do we do? Well, here's y equals three. I didn't label any of this, but you know, here's two, here's four, here's three. Come over here and down here, it looks like about 1.7. Here's one, here's two, that looks like about 1.7. Come over here and down. Here's one, here's two, that looks like about negative 1.7. So we get x values of negative 1.7, 1.7 approximately, ballpark. More accurate would be 1.732. These numbers will never go out of my mind. Uh, yeah, we used them a lot when I was in high school. and, 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 and uh, even, even in college, uh, because they come up so often. And we didn't have calculators, it's slide rules. Um, okay, so there is uh, a synopsis of the first two basic functions. Now, as I said, I haven't said it on this video, but there are five of them, five really important basic functions. And then we get a few more beyond that. Uh, you can, get a good understanding just by understanding the three that I'm giving you today, and then just doing uh, uh, things with those three, or things very similar to what you do with those three. So let's introduce the third of the functions. Um, that the basic reciprocal function y equals one over x. we pretty easily can calculate the y values of 
are our usual X values. Incidentally, all the basic functions start with these same seven X values. And then if we have to exclude one or more of those values for one reason or another, we do. Um, okay, so let's just talk about how we evaluate these. Um, if X is negative two, Y is negative one half. Why is that? Because one over negative two is just negative one half. Okay, and one over negative one, but if X is negative one, one over negative one, well, one over negative one is negative one. Now, let's digress, because when we did this originally, I didn't do this calculation. Originally, I did this one, because this one is just, again, one divided by one half. What's one divided by one half? Again, people often don't know how to divide fractions. Um, put zero here, put one here. Where's one half? Right here. How many one halves does it take to make one? Because that's what division tells you. You divide six by two, you get three. Why is that? Because it takes three twos to make six. Okay, one divided by one half is how many one halves it takes to make one. And it takes two of them. Here's a half and here's a half, that makes one. And the picture tells you way more. than the rules for dividing fractions, although they're very important, they come from the pictures. Pictures start, pictures are first. The, Algorithms we use, the rules we use come from those pictures and those understandings. Uh, and calculator tells you nothing except the answer. So you don't learn anything from the calculator. Now there are ways to use a calculator to learn stuff, but not basic arithmetic. Okay. Uh, one divided by one half is two because it takes a couple of halves to make whole. It takes two halves to make one. It takes two halves to make one. Exactly what I wrote. Um, okay. Well, once you see that one divided by one half is two, you get this number in the table. And then one divided by negative one half is just the same. So you've got a negative in there. So you get a negative two. Okay. Now, what about this one over zero thing? One over zero equals what? Well, one over one half is how many halves it takes to make one. One over zeros, how many zeros it takes to make one? Well, how many zeros do you need to get one? Can't get anything with zeros. All you get is zeros. Zero plus zero is zero. Add another zero, you get zero. Add another, you never get one. Okay. One over zeros, how many zeros we need to make one? There's no answer. Okay. You know, you might say infinity. I know my your grandson would say infinity. Uh, but uh, uh, infinity is not a number. It's just something that our numbers approach. Okay, so anyhow, there's no answer. So one over zero is undefined. It's undefined, so we can't find it. Okay. Okay, well, now our graph, the basic function just consists of these six points here. Six points you see in orange, unless they've been obscured by the blue. Okay. We want to extend them to make a curve. In this case, we have to make two curves. And let me explain why. It's because you don't have a value of this function if x is zero. If you tried to connect these points and then somehow wiggle around and come back up here, you would eventually go through the y-axis. Well, the y-axis is where x equals zero. And wherever you go through the y-axis, you'd be saying that that is the value of one over zero, the value of this function for x equals zero. It doesn't have a value, so you'd be lying. And I don't know if it'd be a lie or just a mistake. I don't think you'd intentionally do it, uh, depending um, on who you're trying to fool. But 
you can't connect this point to this point because that would take you through the y-axis. And also, of course, you get more points than this if you follow this rule for x equals one fourth and one eighth, one sixteenth, and so forth. Okay, uh, but you never get a value here. So anything you would do would distort the shape of the function. We just do the extended basic function then from here to here. We make no attempt to connect this point to this point because they don't connect. And then we connect these three points and we get this kind of nice, uh, smooth, you know, curve, a pair of curves, nice and symmetric about the origin. We'll talk about symmetries. Uh, and this makes a great example of symmetries. I'm not going to get into that today. So there it is. Now, the range of the extended basic function. Well, the range is split up, or, sorry, the domain. Well, the range is split up to the domain of the extended basic function. Well, you have points on this graph corresponding to the x values from negative two to negative one half. And you have points corresponding to the x values from negative from one half to two. If you don't have any points corresponding to the interval, x interval from negative one half to one half. So you say that the domain is the interval from negative one half to one half, this interval, union with the interval from one half to two, this interval. It's union sign, that's what it means. It means that, that you take all these numbers and all these numbers and they make up your domain, okay? The range, for similar reasons, I should have written that in green, to be consistent with the way I wrote it here, but I didn't. Uh, again, from negative one half to negative two, but from negative two to negative one half, and then from one half to two, and you do the union of those two intervals. They're closed intervals, the bracket on the end, but they haven't talked too much about that. This review did a little bit more uh, in the original. Okay. In any case, there you have it. 